Mm-hmm. Okay. That's good. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So maybe we should go around to a, a round of introductions. Uh, Deb, you want to start? Yes, hi. Uh, I'm Deb Roy. I'm on the faculty at MIT. I currently serve as executive director of the MIT Media Lab and uh, also director of uh, a newly formed Center for Constructive Communication, which is going to be my main research home going forward. Um, very nice to meet you. That's awesome. Yeah. Wes? Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Wes Chow. Um, I've been working with Deb in, uh, in various capacities for a few years now, for about, um, I think close to four years. And so now I'm, um, I run a, uh, an engineering group inside of uh, Deb's group that looks at um, the research that the, that the center is doing and, the, um, and helps deploy it out to partners and collaborators. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> And again, you know, I'm Cesar McDowell, and I'm now, I think since we talked last, I'm actually now the Associate Director of Facility Design at the Center that Dan was running. So uh, we are actually connecting even more. <laughs> That's excellent. So I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister in charge of social innovation, open government, and youth engagement. Uh, I, I totally agree uh, with this idea of a kind of norm-based struggle. And my current work mostly centers around what I call people-public-private partnerships, meaning that the social sector sets the norm, the public sector amplifies the norm, and then the private sector implements the norm. Uh, this is rather different from the more traditional so-called public-private partnerships. Uh, love that, love that. Well, I wonder if we could start, Deb, would you mind kind of introducing uh, Audrey to the work there uh, during the C3 and what we're up to? Happy to. Audrey, I have a few slides just to introduce the <laughs> center briefly and then show you sure. uh, what particular project we thought might be of interest. So if that's okay, I'll mm-hmm. please I'll do. Please screen do. And show you a bit of stuff. So the um, new center we announced in January of this year is called the Center for Constructive Communication. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you see my screen now? Yes, very clearly with the three, uh, you know, circles becoming a triangle. (laughs) Great. Um, And um, the challenge that the center is setting out to to work on is is one of social fragmentation. So we observe that in various realms, including politics, at the workplace, on the airwaves and online, on the streets and sometimes even at home, we sense an alarming social fracture. And our aim is to make uh, a problem that's easy to recognize, possible to understand, and hopefully in some ways address. Um, We got into this space, which is of course multi-dimensional and complex, with work we've been doing over the years in analyzing social media so I, I'll just show you, show you briefly two examples. This is a snapshot of um, Twitter users during the 2016 uh, presidential election. Uh, these are accounts that we believe are primarily humans, not bots, that were actively tweeting about the election, um, where the graph is formed by finding mutual follows, which tend to be people who know one another, more likely to know one another. Um, and the color coding shows followers of candidate Trump in red, candidate Clinton in blue, and candidate Sanders in green. Um, It's a picture of a fragmented network, very weak connectivity, uh, relatively speaking, uh, between, by the way, can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay. Well, your cursor, Um, not not your mouse, but yes. (laughs) (laughs) You can see my pointer. Um, and um, I now I now realize I, I must be very precise with my words. <laughs> um, and, and then uh, we also became curious about the location of journalists. So we uh, built a database of the journalists who had written at least one story about the election in a national scale publication in the U.S. <clears throat> and um, shown in blue are verified and yellow unverified uh, location of the accounts of the journalists. Again, all trapped in one side of this fragmented network. Um, so this, this image became for us kind of iconic of uh, you know, the problem of fragmentation. 
Um, one more example to give you a sense of work we were, were doing that led to the center. This is a, another data visualization, in this case, in orange, uh, the retweet cascade shown over, you know, that plays out over time of how a piece of news, which fact checkers la later found to be false, um, propagates through the Twitterverse. And in blue, a, a story that's fact checked and turns out to be um, true. And what we found, and we published these results in 2018, um, is that uh, the um, uh, general pattern across the entire history of Twitter, we built a database of uh, many, uh, of six major fact-checking organizations, took all the news stories they had fact-checked and looked systematically over the history of Twitter and found, in general, that false stories uh, have a huge um, advantage. They, they tend to spread much faster and much further um, than, than true news. So mm -hmm. these are some examples which, as we started thinking about the conditions on the ground, so to speak, of being actually immersed in the actual day-to-day -day, uh, conversations of uh, Twitter and other social platforms, and also we started looking at talk radio, um, just the different public spaces that tend to be where public dialogue plays out, that there's an awful lot of shouting <clears throat> at one another where people are tend to um, we tend to hear the most extreme points of view that are reactive and often disconnected from everyday life and lead to a divisive uh, kind of environment. Um, and of course, the business models of both mainstream media and social media um, tend to um, reinforce and reward extreme and reactive uh, content. Um, and so we, we became interested in thinking about designing uh, new spaces, um, e even if they don't have the scale, of course, of the, the dominant platforms, which were designed um, for listening, where nuanced, reflective conversations grounded in our everyday lives uh, were more likely to flourish, where you would end up with a, a connective rather than divisive kind of uh, spaces. And that's what we mean by the word constructive in the name of our center. Um, these, these various terms kind of get at what we're interested in. I mean, there's sort of three uh, main ideas that kind of flow through many of the projects that are now, um, that we're, we are working on in the center. One is to find a rebalancing of the role of machines so that there is uh, more agency and control put back in the hands of humans, uh, where AI and machine learning we see as um, uh, power tools that can be used to equip people um, as opposed to what's happened with a lot of the social spaces today where the AI, uh, we think, has too much um, agency over what we see, what we're exposed to, and who we connect with. So it's kind of rebalancing. Second is to think about, rather than the online spaces as being uh, sort of alternative realities, to find ways to weave them back together with in-person connection. Um, and even though the internet has this incredible global scale and speed and reach, uh, can we leverage that while uh, creating solutions and spaces that are tuned to local, locally differentiated uh, needs? Um, as Wes mentioned, uh, um, we have an engineering team that Wes leads, um, together with uh, a group of researchers, you know, graduate students and faculty and, and postdocs and so forth. What's interesting is that we can translate research concepts and kind of exploratory research into relatively robust tools that are engineered so that we can actually deploy them with partners outside of MIT and run scalable field pilots. So it's this combination of three different skill sets that makes the center, we think, quite unique um, within at least the academic uh, arena. Um, and with all this, you know, from a, a, a kind of what are we trying to build, we're trying to prototype a better future for communication, media, and social networks. And in terms of the human impact that we, we come back to over and over, it's to surface underheard voices, uh, to bridge divides across different perspectives, and to put all this to work in systems that ultimately, we hope, can build social trust. So there's many projects we're working on, um, and I'm not going to go through them in detail. I'm just going to highlight one for you in a minute. Um, but we are thinking about projects uh, and, and sort of tools and, and designs designed for families in the civic space, which is what I'll highlight for you. We've started doing some work in thinking about how tools 
can be used to inform public health communications. We we'll continue to do work <clears throat> in analyzing and modeling media dynamics. Um, and we started to take interest in some of the work that's coming from actually our civics space to look at what we could also do within organizations, companies, for example, where very similar kinds of social conflict and, and fragmentation um, are showing up. Um, so just two, actually, I guess I have a, a one slide summary, uh, which I thought you might find interesting. We have a, a, a team, and Wes is actually a contributor to this team, that's in the research design phase of thinking about um, uh, and, and designing uh, concepts for a pro-social media platform that's designed for early teens, explicitly designed to promote positive identity development and self-confidence. Um, during the uh, most formative and vulnerable teen years. So we've been working with teens and co-designing steps um, and plan to um, launch a kind of initial pilot platform early next year. So that's sort of um, in the works. Um, the second example uh, is uh, what we call the Local Voices Network. And, and here I'll take you in a little bit more detail. Um, and the goal here um, is to surface underheard voices and experiences for listening, learning, and constructive action. Um, this is actually a project which um, is being operated by a nonprofit, uh, a 501c3 nonprofit called Portico. Uh, I'm, I'm co founder and chair of Portico, which grew out of um, the predecessor to the center and is, works in partnership uh, with the MIT Center to actually operate um, this project. And so we are the research partner, and Portico operates the network. Um, and supports um, partner uh, projects. Um, so the idea was to merge facilitated dialogue and technology to create a kind of scalable system. That's the idea of the mm -hmm. Google Voice Network. So on the facilitation side, we've worked for several years now to develop and sort of test and iterate on the design of a conversation format, which at its heart uh, is really designed to allow participants in small groups to share hopes and concerns. It could be in general about life mm -hmm. in their community, or it could be about a specific topic like public safety or health um, that is grounded in sharing experiences they've had that relate to either the hopes or the concerns. Um, and I'll play you some examples in a minute. We also have uh, designed a piece of hardware. We call this the digital hearth. Mm -hmm. um, it's a battery-operated, self-contained uh, device um, that is designed to actually record a high-quality mm -hmm. mm -hmm. audio recording of small group conversations. And also, uh, so there's a boundary layer mic, there's a microphone array, and there's also a high-quality speaker, so you can play back excerpts of voice from other conversations. And this is a controller for the facilitator, what we call the host of the conversation, to control the heart. Um, so we, we launched in uh, 2019 in Madison, Wisconsin, um, with uh, a key collaborator um, is uh, Professor uh, Kathy Kramer, who's a political scientist, who's done some very innovative work in developing deep listening methods for understanding public opinion. So she um, partnered with us and helped shape the Local Voices Network design and then launched it in her own uh, town of Madison, where we started inviting community partners into training sessions to both learn how to use the technology and also to learn how to the, the facilitation um, uh, sort of structure of these conversations, and then to invite people from their networks into small group conversations, which could be uh, recorded. Um, and of course, with the pandemic, uh, uh, we were unable to do the physical uh, meeting, so we switched to Zoom. Um, in general, when you talk to people after uh, they participate in one of these conversations, they tend to report um, that there was really a space for deep listening where they could listen and learn and speak and be heard, where there was a space for nuanced conversation. In general, people sharing experience. So it's not a place to come and sort of argue your opinion on something, but rather to share your lived experience as it relates to certain topics. Uh, I thought I'd just show you uh, a little bit of um, just the, some of the tooling. So what happens once a conversation is uh, uploaded, either from that device or from a Zoom recording, um, is it goes into this web-based tool 
Um, and there are different collections by, that different partners collect. So I'll just go to the Madison pilot as an example. So we can see all the, the conversations that have been uploaded uh, in this collection from Madison. If you click on uh, into one of these conversations, it takes us into a detailed viewer for that conversation. You can see uh, different topics, housing, nurses, nurses, homelessness, prison that came up, racism. Um, if I click on one of these, I can drill in and listen to the specific parts of the conversation. Okay. Um, I've been dealing with racism for the longest, and I turned the other cheek. Um, so we can uh, navigate into conversations, and then in any particular conversation, we can, if there's a piece of uh, um, the conversation that we want to lift up and share mm -hmm. or use for sense making, you can just select this part of text. The speech is automatically selected with it. And then we can give this high, we can add a note, add tags, and this lifts up and stores this piece of audio, keeps the pointer back to the full conversation, but creates mm -hmm. a, a new piece of um, uh, uh, um, data that can then be uh, used upstream. And I'll show you in a, a second one example of what that looks like. One other, just a couple other things. There's also an automatically generate index. So if you're interested in, uh, you know, housing, we can see different terms that our uh, system has clustered that are related to housing. Um, and then we can go into specific conversations uh, where there is particularly, <laughs> here's, of course, this is, these are housing advocates. Uh, so it was actually a topical conversation and drill in to topics of interest. There's also a, a, a search engine. Um, so we can do just, uh, keyword or sentence based search. Um, so those are some of the tools. And let me just put these pieces together now, just give you a sketch of one uh, recent case study that we are quite excited about. Um, this was actually in Madison. So just to show you how these pieces come together. Once a small group dialogue has been recorded, it goes into the indexed um, search engine. Uh, and I just showed you a couple of different ways that you can then access the conversational data. Um, one of the things that the hearth or through Zoom, a, a host of a future conversation can actually take one of those highlighted pieces of audio, which might be a story, for example, that someone has shared of what they've experienced, perhaps um, in, in a context that this group has never experienced personally. And the host can bring that voice in, introduce the, the person, and then play the audio we call this cross-pollination. Um, and then the host, uh, and then people in this conversation can respond to that person. And in this way, we end up with a conversation network. Um, and all of these conversations are being archived. And we have, and I'll, I'll talk about data permissions uh, um, at the end, but with access to this collection of conversations, what we can do is by taking, this is again, just depicting uh, you know, the speaking pattern of one conversation, uh, we can take a collection of conversations and do pattern analysis, um, which is what we've started experimenting with. So you might, for example, in the example I'll show you relates with, re relates to public safety and policing. So say we identify all of the segments of audio that are related to public safety and policing, and then we might upweight um, and prioritize the subset where it's people who are sharing firsthand experiences that they themselves have experienced, not something they saw or heard about, but they themselves experienced. Um, and then prioritize those pieces of audio. We can uh, sort them using our tools um, powered by people <laughs> into themes such as power, trust, and fear. Um, and um, uh, Caesar, is it? Can you give me some advice? Uh, have I gone too long, or do we have time for a three-minute audio uh, sample? Uh, it's not, I think you can uh, do a little bit of the audio. I think the more important thing is just the, the report out, because you're going to do the piece from the uh, police, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So, OK, let me just play a little bit of the audio, and then I'll skip. So, so Audrey, just you can get a sense of the texture of the speech, and then I'll show you what we did with this. Um. It's hard to get away from how powerful 
you know, the institution and the badge and having a gun is and how much that emboldens individuals? Uh, well, I mean, growing up, one of, one of the first <laughs> values and principles that I was taught was to never trust the police in any situation or circumstance. Uh, and then that was kind of proven to me around age 12 or 13 when I saw a family member be shot in the back eight times. Yes. Um, Yo todavía tengo pavor, eh, el pavor que tenía cuando no tenía el, la, la licencia, este, que cada vez que veo si eran como unos 10, 10 patrullas ahí, este, eh, a ver a, a quién iban, iban a agarrar. So, so um, what we then did for this particular uh, case is we had an opportunity to work with the, the committee that was charged with hiring the police chief in Madison, um, there was under a racially charged situation, the previous police chief very suddenly quit his job, uh, wrote a blog post on a Sunday night and said, I'm not coming in Monday morning. And so the Madison Police and Fire Commission um, reached out to us and said they were interested in running a different kind of search process and they wanted to hear from community voices to get input into the process. And we were already uh, we had already started this pilot work, and so we did this analysis, and for each of the themes where these purple blocks, again, represent multiple different stories from different conversations that all fit a certain pattern, we, tr we summarized each pattern and translated them into a recommended question that could be asked to the candidates for police chief. So, for example, it seems that police fear some of the communities they work in and in the community and the communities fear the police in return what fears have you observed in the communities you police them so uh, what Caesar referred to Audrey is we uh, created a report that actually went through each different theme uh, provided a, a text summary where the words and phrases of this the text summary actually pointed to examples of the actual audio snippets and then next to the summary, we provided one or two recommended questions. So there was a report that had these multiple themes. Um, what actually happened was that the, um, the police and fire commission chose several of our questions and explained beforehand where the questions came from, that they were rooted in uh, conversations from the community. And they used those questions in a series of public interviews with the final four candidates. And in fact, Sean Barnes, who's shown here during one of these public interviews, was ultimately selected and sworn in as the new police chief earlier this year. So just to summarize, the idea here was that the, at this very you know, important uh, and publicly visible uh, point in the process of selecting a new leader, um, the questions were actually grounded in community voice. And because this tool uh, that I, I showed briefly is available for other members of the Madison public to uh, access. Um, it creates a transparent uh, kind of extension to the normal public square that is more inclusive because a lot of people who would not feel comfortable going to the town square um, uh, may feel more comfortable going to these small group conversations knowing that they're being recorded and that there will be a durable voice record, just like this conversation today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that by being able to see where your voice goes and know that in this case, the interviews are being run by uh, in response to these patterns, it creates a kind of accountability, a kind of mutual visibility that we think is really important. Um, and um, so let me stop sharing. Um, that was the example that I, I wanted to speak you through. So thank you mm -hmm. for uh, listening. Um, we, um, I'll, I'll just note one thing that we're in the midst now of discussing internally, which is um, the, the data model. What we're thinking about is um, having a model of a, a kind of a data trust where the nonprofit Cortico serves as the data, uh, the trustee of the data, and um, each of the different partners that gather uh, people in their community um, own that collection of conversations. And under certain um, uh, conditions, other partners that are gathering similar kinds of conversations 
can all listen to one another. Um, and, and sort of that whole system is um, the sort of steward of the data is the nonprofit. That's sort of a, a model that we're trying to uh, uh, clean up and, and put into place. So um, that's, a, that's a, a sketch of our center and one of the major projects. Um, and I will just mention that just by total coincidence, just earlier today, we hosted um, a talk and then had a in-depth discussion with um, Colin ah, uh, McGill. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. and, uh, and, and we, I mean, those are two conversations that started at, at different moments with different people in our team. I mean, I reached out to Colin and uh, such a strange coincidence that both of these uh, conversations are happening today. But we, we have been exploring, uh, Colin and I, possible connections between local voices network and polis where it might be that the cold start problem of where do you get seed opinion statements um, it's very interesting to us to think about these participant driven small group conversations um, as a source for potentially uh, getting statements that can seed polis and um, and actually we just uh, a after the the conversation today with Colin I, I had a conversation with one of the one of our collaborators, Kathy Kramer, and she also thought that once Polis uh, is able to help identify some statements that may have either be divisive or connective, those could be a very interesting prompt for LVN conversations to you know mm -hmm. so the, the kind of different uh, ways these can be connected. So we're we're very in, we've taken real interest in Polis and also very interested in, of course, your pioneering use of Polis. Uh, in, in what you've done in v Taiwan, so um, I, I think uh, I could keep going and going, but I better stop talking. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I, I enjoy listening. Um, <laughs> that, that's what we're here for. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Uh, I have uh, three uh, very quick kind of clarifying questions. Uh, one is that does it depend on the equipment that you mentioned or is it okay if we, for example, just import J this Jitsi conversation into the system? Um, we just need an audio recording. Uh, the, the hardware device, because it has a microphone array, um, makes it easier to separate speakers uh, because we want to have the kind of association of speakers to uh, the different ribbons. But um, it does not have to be Zoom. Any high, any high quality audio recording. Okay, so even if it's in a single track, you just you do uh, speaker uh, recognition uh, to tease yeah. it apart. But of course, if it starts multi-track, like some podcast recording software to begin with, then of course that simplifies your work. That's much, much better. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because that, that's what we're, we've been experimenting with. So uh, the second thing, um, so you, you mentioned that um, you would like to work with the nonprofit as a quote unquote data trust uh, where they <coughs> do co cooperative uh, stewardship. Does it mean that the software code, because like Polis, it's now running at polis.gov.tw, uh, which is our own uh, data center with the entire stack, including the, the data and the source code. We hire professional penetration testers uh, and things like that. So it's just like any other uh, open source free software liber uh, project. Uh, so is your software designed to, to act like this, like in a self-hosted situation and with many forks and a upstream and things like that? At the moment, no, but it's an interesting model. We're, we're uh, definitely, as we're getting to know Polis and uh, and Colin, just learning about um, about all that. Currently, yeah. um, Wes, I think, is it fair to say, uh, Wes was the head of engineering at Portico before coming over to the center, so it was quite familiar with uh, both okay. sides. Um, uh -huh. uh, Wes, any, any comment on that? I think oh, you're muted. We can't hear you. Yeah, we need to uh, unmute. Yes. Um, we, we use a fairly standard um, sort of uh, con containerization and deployment strategy. So it, it wouldn't be a whole lot of effort, I think, to start up another instance of, of, the, um, uh, of, of the site and the infrastructure. Um, I mean, it's, it's you know, not, not a trivial amount of work, but it's, like, it's doable. 
but but it's not designed to uh, to work in like a federated way where we then join audio at you know at, at like a higher node or something. It's just it would be like a completely separate thing. No, no, I mean the project management side because when Poll is open sourced. Uh, the kind of first major contribution, I think, was from the Canadian government, uh, where they did this automated English French because for federal conversations they're required to to be bilingual, uh, and then we uh, adopted that and then contributed uh, to like the English Mandarin uh, auto translation stuff uh, and so on. So my my point is, uh, as long as it's open source to the data steward, uh, the data steward mm -hmm. will be motivated to do customizations. Usually, begin with maybe in your context uh, English Spanish. Uh, multilingualization right. and and so uh, the management the governance model changes previously it's uh, kind of a software as a uh, sorry service as a software substitute uh, but now uh, once it becomes self-hosted and people start modifying it uh, you'll be working with a more kind of co-governing relationship of the project mm -hmm. itself uh, it is it, right. uh, because that's kind of a logical consequence uh, and and is it uh, aligned uh, with your values yeah, I, I, I think um, I think the product engineering team is um, receptive to making the code open source. Um, I mean, yeah, like I don't I don't think there there would be any objections. Um, mm -hmm. I think to to this date, it, it's really it's been a matter of like prioritizing the work stream sure. and, and mm -hmm. making sure. it open source. Sure, of course, right. of course. Yeah, because once it's open source, uh, it doesn't have to go to GitHub immediately, right? Open source only means when uh, when you're when the people using your software ask you nicely, uh, you provide a copy yeah, of the source code <laughs> as the original yeah. definition. Uh, so, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, well, also ideally, we you know we, we would make at least some kind of a commitment to help help people um, you know fix problems and stuff. Right? Yeah, that that's right. So uh, and uh, once you do that, uh, we'll be happy to provide the same service we did provide to Sandstorm, Polis, and so on, uh, which is world-class penetration testers uh, to make sure that okay. it's cybersecurity-wise, uh, it, it's uh, hardened. Uh, and so that's that's a uh, something we can do right away once it's open source, um, not on GitHub, like open source by commitment. Okay, and and the third thing uh, is a very minor thing. Uh, I, I witnessed that um, in the deliberative space, uh, around two thirds of people say hopes and fears. One third of people say hopes and concerns. Is there a conscious choice <laughs> that you went with the hopes and concerns? <laughs> oh, well, the um, there's an interesting. DNA to the conversation structure. There is a, um, a nonprofit group called the uh, Public Conversations Project that started uh, mm -hmm. maybe 30 years ago. Caesar, is that you uh, may know the history better than me? Uh, with uh, kind of the family counseling um, kind of uh, uh, approach to having convers difficult conversations, um, and uh, that group uh, helped design the first iteration of our conversation. Uh, it's now Essential Partners. Um, and then eventually the executive director of Essential Partners became the, the CEO of Portico, the nonprofit. Um, and, and so we did that work with them. I believe the, the basic framing of hopes and concerns um, uh, either came from, from them or from Kathy Kramer, one or, one mm -hmm. or the other. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, uh, yeah, so your, your question is, why concern versus fear? Right, because concerns is more like uh, that we're co-creators here, right? Uh, it, mm -hmm. It's on the table. Hopes and fears is like there's a power imbalance, and we're we're here to try to ride that power imbalance. So it, it's it's rather different approach uh, to mm -hmm. to set the agenda. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's it. Okay, no, just yeah. a just yeah. a just a random question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, right. mm -hmm. yeah, so I was just thinking uh, in another. Projects we're testing out uh, with this with uh, a technique I've been using. The way we start the conversation is we we have a framing. Uh, so the framing we're using this one is we ask people what's their question about the future of America, and people start the conversation by saying what their question is, and then they and then the next question is what's your experience in your life that actually got you to that question, ah. and we use that as the vehicle for opening up kind of the conversation. So it's not waiting either way, it's just like, you know, you have something you have a question about and you have a set of experiences. And then what we try to do in some of these efforts is connect people who have similar questions mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. share their experience so they can have a broader view 
Mm -hmm. how the thing they're interested in actually is experienced in a broader, has really different entry points to it. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that, that, yeah. that's very clear. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, anything else you would like to bring up? Uh, I asked my clarifying questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, you moved it. I, I was just going to say that I, I'm definitely curious about your experience with Polis. We've read some of the case studies of how mm -hmm. it's been used in Taiwan, and we heard quite a bit more about the tool and, and plans from Colin. I was curious, um, oh, kind of current status, is, uh -huh. is it, uh -huh. does it remain uh, uh -huh. in use as yeah. a tool? Yeah, it's, and, it's part of our public infrastructure, right? polis.gov.tw means it's a, a kind of permanent part uh, of the, the governance uh, mechanism, right? We, we run the penetration testing. Uh, we were with Colin to fix cybersecurity issues. We wrote our own terms of service, which I believe is already deployed now. Uh, and so in, in all senses, uh, we are now a kind of um, co-governing node of the police uh, ecosystem because uh, everything that our public service needs uh, to run police, they can just do so, just like launching a, I don't know, Google Forms survey or a survey cake or something, uh, but uh, understanding that a cybersecurity situation is better, right? So, so it's now a kind of general purpose tool for all the public service to use. And there's a public instance also at polis.tw uh, where the civil society, investigative journalists, and so on uh, also can use. Of course, it doesn't carry the same um, .gov, .tw, like government initiative status, uh, but maintenance and code-wise, it's the same cybersecurity hardened coding infrastructure. And um, in your experience, has there been certain patterns of where, in what kind of situations it is most useful or helpful, mm -hmm, and sure. mm -hmm. also where you have observed the biggest um, pain points? Mm -hmm. What's what's difficult about using it? Sure. Uh, I mean, we ask calling the same questions and uh -huh. uh, I can some of the things we learned, but I was curious what you're sure. Uh, I mean, we have, a, we have a national level regulation that says when to use tools like Polis. Uh, and so, uh, and uh, we have teams in each um, uh, ministry and competent authority that uh, says that the training uh, is, which, which training is required uh, to run such uh, issues. So I, I'll be posting uh, that into the chat. Uh, I believe there is uh, a uh, entire website about principles of processing collaborative topics uh, and so things that uh, have complex stakes, diverging views of multiple stakeholders and uh, enthusiastic publish uh, participation that results in the need of interdepartmental collaboration. Uh, these are where uh, Polis shines. Uh, I'm posting the link here. Uh, on that website, you can, uh, under the collaborative meetings menu, uh, see the process, toolkits, the guidelines, all the past 100 or so collaborative meetings, the directions, the national uh, regulations that enable this uh, 100 or so person collaborative facilitator in the government structure. Uh, so I'll not be reading it out, out loud there, uh, but, but we do have a, a pretty uh, well-tested process in the past five years that runs uh, these things. You know what's fascinating for me about just kind of hearing is, is uh, the different systems for actually integrating something into a governmental infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I mean, just very different in our societies, right? I mean, for us, something like Polis, you almost have to think about how to grab it in civil society mm -hmm. as, a, as a mechanism as opposed to actually a tool for government mm -hmm. uh, because our processes are so different. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's not a good thing. That's what I'm saying. That's not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but we, our gov tech we, is actually civic tech, just implemented by government contractors. So that's yeah. that's the fundamental difference. In in the U.S., I understand the USDS is like us, right? Is the gov tech, uh, and the 18F uh, was more kind of uh, connected to the Co for right. America, Co for All, and so on. Uh, but um, I I don't think there is a single case where the civic tech side wrote this implement uh, wrote the specification uh, and did a reverse procurement where the government has to implement it. Uh, so it it only flows this way and not that way is what I mean. But 
in our case, it almost always flows this way. I, I'm pasting a link in a recent uh, SMS-based uh, check and trace uh, system that was co-developed that way as well on our blog. Uh, so I think that's the main uh, kind of infrastructural difference uh, between our polities, which uh, is why I'm very excited to, to try out uh, the kind of uh, kind of um, quality enhancing um, topic to address your question uh, about the pain points of polis uh, is that when something is very enthusiastic publicly and we get like 300, 500 statements, um, uh, like each person only goes through some of them and currently it's just showing things randomly. Uh, and so people's uh, average experience uh, degrades slightly the more statements they're in. But if we do have this kind of quality highlighting uh, mechanism, then we actually uplift uh, the experience uh, every time that the rough consensus or good enough consensus is reflected back uh, into the police system. So police become the connector between the in-person conversations, uh, just like you know machines should be the kind of in-between uh, of humans, right? So, so it's not uh, about placing uh, machines in the place of facilitators, but placing machines uh, across uh, time and space. Uh, for different facilitators to work together. So what do you mean by lifting lifting up high quality? I, I, didn't, I didn't understand mm -hmm. that part. Sure. So uh, part of our use in V Taiwan in Polis is to invite the people who have received a high resonance uh, across different groups in Polis and invite them to the meeting place face to face in person uh, or at least uh, through high quality broadband video conference uh, to share the full context uh, that led to them, uh, their kind of uh, eclectic interpreting uh, statements uh, that get so much support. So in a sense, this is uh, more like um, trusting the persons who posted these ideas that mm -hmm. resonate with all to kind of serve as advocates to contextualize this. Uh, but your system, as I understand, uh, flips this around, right? In small group conversations, uh, I can talk uh, for hours, uh, but the moments where I behave in a pro-social way can be pro uh, highlighted and, and say, this moment of yours uh, resonates with other moments of these people. Uh, and so it highlights the statements, the common hood of the statements, like a common, how might we question, uh, that could be fed into the polis conversation. So that in the polis conversation, we start with the arguments that already have um, good enough uh, resonance. And then uh, the polis situation will uh, begin to uh, innovate even more because we spend less time uh, to go through the parts that checks uh, the kind of missing context, missing pieces and so on. We start with a kind of, by definition, definition more resonating statements and then once we get the um, you know good enough consensus around that conversation then we set that as a topic for more small group conversations uh, to work with so in the beginning of each police conversation uh, people don't feel uh, that they are spending a lot of time to weed through uh, the points that has been iterated before got it got it yeah yes um, uh, that is um, that's yeah that's very much the kind of concept that we discussed with Colin. I had discussed with Colin earlier today. Uh, he was quite, he was very interested in exploring as well. Um, uh, do you have a sense of what kind of people today, what, what are the characteristics of uh, citizens who are more likely to engage with? Mm -hmm, sure. People, people uh, who are 16 or 17 years old. Uh, or six, 60 or 70 years old. <laughs> These are the two age groups that are the most active on our participation platforms. A, they have more time on their hands, and B, they care about the next generation, um, kind of by definition. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, anything regarding are people who. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I was just thinking about how else to to the kind of other dimensions, major dimensions, like uh, uh, you know, education, gender. But actually, what we, what I started yeah. thinking about. Is, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, we we don't see much of that in in Taiwan. Um, we, we do have, you know, universal broadband and digital competence education and healthcare uh, as a human right. So uh, we don't see much uh, pattern differences uh, between the conversations that had on the rural or urban areas. Of course, they may bring different viewpoints, but the participating uh, activity is very similar. Uh, 
And um, I would think, it's a, I found it always fascinating in, in the United States, um, some of the patterns around the spoken word versus the written word, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the relationship to level of education and literacy rates. Uh, I don't mean necessarily uh, functionally illiterate, but if you are less uh, comfortable with the written word, mm -hmm. you'll have a preference for radio uh, as consumption. Since everything is text-based, uh, is there any um, selection bias there? People who feel more versus less comfortable expressing themselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in writing. Well, there are, just like in participatory budgeting process, there are people yeah. who are more uh, Effinent huh, with text uh, that uh, participate on the discussion board stage, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, there are people who are more comfortable with the spoken word, so they do that on the kind of collaborative meeting stage, uh, just like uh, the a PB process. We always have a in-person plus a video conference um, collaboration meeting stage uh, that uh, holds ourselves to account to uh, explore the agenda that's set by the police stage, right? So there are people who wait until that moment uh, to join and previously they mostly just observe of course that's quite natural uh, but uh, when it comes to the kind of um, selecting uh, the cases through e-petition or in Taiwan we have referenda right uh, then because re really just press like uh, which is what a referenda petition as a continent is right uh, it is is so low threshold uh, everybody does it anyway so uh, what what I mean is that we create a space for the modes of conversation uh, that are tailor-made to the people who are comfortable with that conversation. So for example, we held town halls where I travel to the more rural or remote areas and join them where they are as a facilitator. But then we uh, video conference in the central government people, but it serves uh, um, explicitly as a kind of expert, uh, consultative expert role, meaning that they don't share anything until asked, but they uh, provide the contextualizing information to the local people over video conference without having to travel over Taiwan and so on. So we designed the space always to put um, inclusivity first and people who uh, are not comfortable with some mode of conversation either just trust their friends uh, to speak on their behalf in that mode or they wait until the part in the process where their um, preferred mode uh, shines. I know we don't have much more of your time uh, <laughs> and uh, there are a couple of things that uh, I kind of see here that I just want to kind of Tested. One is, one is actually a question. Uh, there, when uh, folks when we were going to have this conversation with you, there were a whole bunch of folks that said, I want to be there, I want to be there. <laughs> and the question is, would you be open to maybe sometime in the fall, sometime actually having a more open conversation, mm -hmm, presentation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. That, yeah. that would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd love to do that. Mm -hmm. And then it seems like uh, in this conversation about uh, homeless and what Colin's dealing with, uh, what you have in place, you're actually maybe a, a kind of three-way way to work together to kind of think about this situation, something like LD and homeless and some place to test it out or robust or something, maybe need a meeting of yours or ours. I don't know if it will or not, but maybe it's a, uh, also a place where we can mm -hmm. uh, kind of test out some Mm -hmm. uh, possibly working together. Yeah, de definitely, working together. definitely. Uh, I, I'm because now I understand we can retroactively feed uh, existing audio recordings as long as it's quite qu high quality into the system instead of running new consultations. Uh, one of the first things we can do if we have access to the system uh, is just to put the 100 or so collaborative meeting, uh, which are all recorded in rather high quality, and and see if it works. And then uh, because the majority of our conversation was in Mandarin, uh, we will also be uh, testing the multilingualization and internationalization capabilities. That's interesting. Very interesting. Well, that's cool. Uh, there, Wes, anything else you want to say as well? Uh, just a, um, a, a small clarifying question there. So the, these conversations that you're referring to, um, mm -hmm. uh, on average, how many participants are there? So uh, the small groups are uh, always like 
10 persons uh, per table-ish uh, with three to maybe five tables. Uh, so a, a small room, basically. Uh, but uh, for each collaborative meeting topic, we may hold multiple such rooms and sometimes interconnected in the kind of inform stage. Uh, and then we break out into multiple rooms. Uh, and we almost always have a video uh, recording that has separate channels. Uh, and uh, sometimes we also live stream it. And then uh, the live stream may be played in some other room uh, which then uh, have their own conversation that's done as well okay. well I want to thank you very much for taking the time to be with us this evening uh, mm -hmm. and I hope this is just the first of another conversation and we'll reach back out to Francis about the yep. discussions in the fall yep. uh, that would be great uh, mm -hmm. Deb anything you want to say in closing uh, just thank you for your time Fascinating to hear about your incredible work, and I, I really uh, am excited to, to welcome you into the MIT community sometime in the fall to, to share this with a larger group. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and and I, I noticed on the chat there's a question about digital divide. Uh, and I will just very quickly say that uh, in Taiwan, because universal broadband is a human right, uh, we don't have that much of a problem there. I understand theoretically uh, in polities with a digital divide, uh, it will be democratically illegitimate uh, to run this as part of a democratic institution. But we simply don't have that problem there. Uh, and uh, in the 20 or so percent of people who've never installed an app uh, for public uh, tool purposes. That's exactly why uh, we made sure that you can use toll-free numbers, SMS-based systems showing up in person, uh, and things like that instead of interacting through specific uh, apps. So I personally have flip phones uh, running uh, the Kai OS. So anything that phones uh, can run <laughs> is inclusive. Uh, but bandwidth uh, is unlimited data plan for just 16 US dollars per month. So we're, we're pretty good. There. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Well, yeah, thanks so much, Minister. Mm -hmm. And Francis, thank you for arranging everything. And uh, uh -huh. talk to you soon. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Yeah, Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.